Okay, welcome. Can everyone see me? Yeah. Good. Can everyone hear me now? Can you all hear me? Yeah, I can. Okay, uh, basically what we're gonna do today is essentially go over um, using a different textbooks, uh, a different textbooks PowerPoint. It's, it, 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 it was written by a different author of, instead of the textbook, but it'll serve again as an introduction to you or whatever else, and we'll just be going through that. The other thing is I did get the surveys. I appreciate those. Those of you that have not filled out those surveys regarding whether you wanna come virtual or not and kind of rank them, because basically the way it's going to work, if you put a definite preference for coming in person, I'll get, I'll send you an email to all the people who want to be in person, come on Monday, okay? And those that definitely want to be on uh, 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 virtual, I'll get send them an email. The others, if they're like 50-50, you can come back and forth, okay? So basically there are a few that want to come on some days and not on others. Uh, which is fine. Like I think one person wanted to come on Monday, but or wanted to come on the other days, but not on Monday, or, or on Monday, but not the other days. So again, it's a situation where if we have a relative e equal 50-50, I might say, well, all of you that want to come in person can, and those that don't, and then we'll play it by ear that way. Is that okay with everybody on on the other end? Is that okay with everybody on, yeah. on, the, on yeah. the video portion? Did you hear what I was saying? Hello? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, okay. that's fine. Okay, wonderful. All right, very good. So um, basically what I'll do now is I'll go to the, uh, the PowerPoint and then share the screen with you. And uh, basically we'll, we'll start. And these other PowerPoints are listed in the other listing. If you want to look, I've got two others that I'm not using that you're welcome to look at too if they help you with that. So uh, basically we'll start now and what I'll do first is move to this. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I, I'm gonna share the screen with you now so you'll see the PowerPoint. Okay, everybody? Okay, everybody? Yeah, sounds good. Good. Okay. All right. Can you see me now? Can you see the PowerPoint? Yes. Okay, wonderful. All right. So basically what we're going to do is talk about the purpose of chemistry in life. And uh, it's a science for the 21st century. And essentially the way it works regarding it, it is the study of matter. Um, and so what I, I'll make the pen valuable now. Okay, so essentially you have, it is the study of matter. And that is relevant to all these different area, health and medicine, like sanitation, surgery, vaccines, gene therapy, fossil fuel, solar energy, nuclear energy. They're all important categories that involve chemistry. Okay, if you're going into biology or the health sciences, that's a, chemistry is important there as well. So basically, it's very useful to understand kind of how they fit together. Materials and technology. Okay, there are all sorts of materials. That plastic bottle. What does it say on the side? Does it say it's one of those ones that's recyclable or something? Is there a number on it? 
What does it say what it's made of? Some of them do. But in any case, there's a triangle on most plastic bottles that have a one, two, or three in it. Usually it says what kind of plastic it is. And most of them are recyclable or quote unquote biodegradable. So there's a whole bunch of different ones. And basically most of these ones are best burned. Why are they best burned? Why are they best burned? If they can't be recycled by making it into new plastic, why are they best burned? Well, then you get the energy out of them. The key thing is having waste disposal plants that burn trash in an efficient manner to generate power. And that's what a lot of uh, communities are coming up with is efficient power plants so they can generate power to feed it back in the grid. Because essentially a polymer is like pure energy. It's like gasoline all put together again. And if you burn it efficiently, you get it. But that's chemistry. So basically there's stuff like polymers, ceramics, liquid crystals, room temperature superconductor, genetically modified crops, natural pesticides, specialized fertilizers. Now, are genetically modified crops bad for you? No. Why? Well, the common corn you eat, corn on the cob, that was originally Mexican maize. And basically they went through, farmers went through things to make it edible for people. So there was manipulation that farmers did. There's all sorts of peas that were developed the same way, all sorts of different legumes by essentially doing that. They do it with orchids too. That is genetic manipulation. So if they do it in laboratories, it really ain't different. No, that has to do with whether you wanna have a soybean that, that can be prevented to, uh, to uh, resist certain bugs. And so they, they bring certain genes in from a tobacco plant that has nicotine in it. But what, what is the function of nicotine? And this is chemistry also. What is the function of ni nicotine in a tobacco plant? It is a pesticide. It kills bugs, okay? So they grow very efficiently. Well, it also happens to give humans the buzz or the, or, or the um, constricted blood vessels or whatever, a pleasing sensation, but it's highly addictive. But the fact that it's a pesticide that kills bugs, it's almost like it gives you pause. Do I really want to put that in my lungs? Okay, whether it come as a, va a vaping device or which is pure nicotine and a little of flavor or, they, or it's in tobacco. But again, there's certain value for each of these different things, uh, understanding the nature of this and it's all chemistry. Specialized furniture, fertilizer, ammonium phosphate is one of them. And I talked about that before, ammonium phosphate, it, has, it, it looks like this. Ammonium phosphate is one, uh, or diammonium phosphate, it's called DAP. That's ammonium phosphate. And another one is ammonium nitrate. And essentially what those both do is they put nitrogen back in the soil that was taken out when the food was grown, okay? But ammonium nitrate is the thing, the stockpile that blew up in Lebanon because they, they had a ship for going to these to fertilize crops, but unfortunately they also use it to make bombs, mixing it with fuel oil to make bombs. But the point is, again, by far most of ammonium nitrate and diammonium phosphate are used around the world to fertilize crops. And is a different from taking that or taking bird poop and putting it over, uh, per, putting it over the fields? No, not really, or manure. Because when I was growing up, they used to use manure, whether it be cow manure, horse manure, or, or pig manure on different farms in Pennsylvania. And I could smell it certain times of year up when, when they would put them into the fields. Was that good for fertilizer for the fields? Of course it was, okay? They don't do that anymore because they do it, make it more efficiently. So basically the chemists develop pure, pure things to go in there. And that, believe it or not, that's one reason food doesn't taste as good as it used to regarding watermelons and other things because the fertilizer for the crops is the pure chemical and not all the other blending things which give it flavor, which is, kind of weird because I used to love watermelon when I was your age, but now it's just like bland, watery stuff and whatever. It's, it's very rare to get a good watermelon these days, okay? 
the study of chemistry is essentially going from macroscopic to microscopic. In other words, this box is cellulose, but then you go down to microscopic as to what the compounds are and everything else, whether it be, um, this is an iron, this is iron solid, this is a compound iron oxide that comes from the reaction of that with oxygen gas. So essentially the iron solid, like in a nail rusting, that is a chemical reaction taking place. Okay, so essentially you've got a series of things related to that. Now, how is this all investigated? And this is what I particularly like about this slide. And I, and I addressed it briefly a little bit in the first lecture. It all has to do when I was talking about the caveman and seeing lightning hit the trees and other things like that. And basically the scientific method essentially is a systematic approach to research. What do you start with? Observation, and that could be with the five senses. What is the best analytical device you have in your own, your, you have in your own body? What is the best analytical device, the most accurate, the most, uh, the most efficient, the most uh, precise analytical device you have? And it, it, it does, it, it, it pro provides a lot of safety for you. What, what is it? No, the, of the census. No, even more than, even more important, the smell, okay? Because basically even blind people really need their sense of smell, okay? Uh, if, if someone is blind, they can adjust from it. So the senses are what's important. That's where you get observations. The key thing about this is, and this is the, the center thing of philosophy about how the Western world looks at science, okay? What we observe is real. Philosophically, what does that mean? What we observe is real. Any philosophers out there? Well, it, what it means is what we observe is real. We take that seriously because if it was all illusion, it wouldn't matter, okay? Or if it was totally subjective, it wouldn't matter. My opinion would be just uh, of what I observe would be irrelevant to someone else because they could see something totally different. Well, it doesn't work that way. In practicality, because we all have the same five senses, we observe things, we label them, so we all understand, unless one is colorblind, that is the color red because it's defined as being red, okay? Or that is blue because it's defined as being blue. And again, it's about definitions, okay? But if someone is colorblind and they don't even know what red looks like, then they have nuances in there so that they can determine, their brain could figure out what red, what red sort of looks like based on other wavelengths as their cones are thing. But again, it comes down to, um, it, it comes down to what is real and what isn't, okay? And so it's a kind of thing where in a way, it's a matter of understanding that. So you first start out with the observation. Okay, the next thing is representation. And this usually involves measuring. Okay. Okay, and essentially you start with the observation and you come up with an educated guess, which is a, called a hypothesis. And then lastly, the interpretation what is happening, and this is a theory, okay? So again, and then why does it go back to the beginning again? Well, these are tested, they go back there. These are tested with more observations, and then it goes through the series again. So you go through, you come up with a theory, uh, 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 which is a tested hypothesis, Okay, and that you have the theory and then you fine tune it. Now, Isaac Newton was one of the first ones that discovered the law of gravity back in the early 1800s. It was very useful for that day. 
over the years, the theory of gravity, Einstein and others came up and fine tuned it. So it changed gradually based on experimentation. Okay, that's what scientists do. They have that kind of uh, thing regarding that. And so basically as those things go, go around with this, you essentially get a fine tuned theory more and more. One of the old theories of the early church was that the, that the earth was the center of the universe and that everything rotated around the sun and that the early observers or whatever were usually priests or monks or others that had time to do it. Everyone else was out working. And so basically they would look up at the heavens and they said, well, I'm gonna interpret the Bible this way. The, the earth is the center of the universe. So they basically viewed the stars as uh, essentially, they wanted to look at the stars and, and find evidence to agree what they did. Then Galileo Galilei came up with, after he invented the telescope, came up looking up and he saw the moons going around Jupiter and also saw the moons going around other planets. And then real, he realized that the moon was going around the earth. So in a way, the fact that those moons were going around Jupiter made it more complicated. But then by that time, whatever else by far, despite the Pope excommunicating him others, there were enough scientists regarding the other clergy and others who were educated to do that, that agreed with them. So then they had Copernicus and others there. And it's really fascinating that that whole science of how the theory of, of the nature of our solar system changed, okay? And it works the same way in chemistry, okay? So you got a series of things regarding to that. And it all starts with the observation, whether it's observation of fire or observing the skies, observation the moon around the earth or other things like that, okay? So basically there are all sorts of different views about the nature of the earth, whether it's flat and whether we're on the, uh, on the earth is riding on the back of a turtle, like a plate or something, that, that's one vision, or whether it's a sphere, a total sphere, or whether it, they realize later, based on experimentation, it's oblong, but again, that doesn't mean the earlier ones were necessarily wrong. It just happened to be good enough from their perspective. Okay, so all that's all about how science works. Now, a hypothesis is a tentative explanation for a set of observations. And what I'm going to do is erase what's on the slide. I, it will it will be in the um, it will be on the uh, it will be on the uh, the video. And unfortunately, last, yesterday's video uh, did not get recorded. I had to set it up so it would automatically record. It didn't get recorded, so it didn't get put on there. So my apologies to those that looked for it. But an hypothesis is a tentative explanation for a set of observations. It is an educated guess. Okay? Now, let me go back to my being a four-year-old and seeing the paint go on the wall and dry. If you remember my story, what did I think at the time? Just in my four-year-old kid head. That, that I could wipe it off, okay? It would get on my clothes or whatever else, but eventually I couldn't wipe it off. And then I'd start asking questions. Well, why can't I wipe it off? Why didn't it dry? And so then I tried to wet it again and it, it still didn't come off. So again, I knew it was more complicated, but with my brain and my, the fact my mom couldn't explain it, I didn't, don't think my dad could either. I probably asked him to, but I don't remember. The point is I didn't learn until college how it worked. But when I learned it, it, it was very interesting. But again, I, even when I was four or five years old, had made those educated guesses. And what I'll do sometime is uh, if I can find that picture, I'll, I'll send you a copy of the picture. It's, it's cute. but. Uh, in any case, it's me and my romper set with a, with a paintbrush in my hand and kind of a got paint on me or whatever. It's really weird that I still have it. But in any case, the point is, the point is uh, it, everybody hypothesizes and makes educated guess because we all want to make sense of the world, whether it's a little boy or a little girl or whether it's an adult, okay? Uh, the next, again, they're tested and modified. When it's tested, it becomes a theory and then it's modified again. So it goes through a series of them 
related to this, okay? A law is a concise statement of a relationship between it's always the same under the same conditions. So essentially you have always the same under the same conditions. But it's accepted as true. Did the early church accept as true that the earth was the center of the universe? Yes, overall they did over hundreds of years, but then, then gradually it changed when observations were able to be better with, it, with regarding the nature of telescopes because it, they needed telescopes to be able to see and make observations through it to fine tune the, to fine tune the thing. Does anybody understand that distinction? Does that mean that the early pe people were wrong? No, it was their perspective and they had retrograde things and all sorts of other stuff to explain it and everything else, but they, they, they started with a presumption, but you always saw it as a presumption, but it's accepted as true, always the same under the same conditions. But the problem is always, you don't know whether there, there might be one exception out of a million which kind of makes it complicated. So in a way, Allah, I, I, I like to see it as more accepted as true for general purposes, just like the law of gravity, the way Einstein looked at it was real and useful for that age. But, now, but then Einstein came along and modified it to be a little bit more complicated. So again, neither of them were wrong, okay? For example, mass times acceleration is equal to force. And I'll, I'll delete the card from this. This is a law. This is a law. Force equals mass times acceleration, but it, oops. It is defined as, defined as true. Force is defined as mass times acceleration. The mass would be in kilograms, and this would be meters per second squared. And it's defined in that way. Defined as true. So in a way, a, a law is something defined as being true for the purposes of what you're doing. A theory is a unifying principle that explains a body of facts or those laws based on them. It is a tested hypothesis. Were there tests that the early the, the early astronomers could do to kind of prove that the Earth was the center of the universe? Sure, there were a few tests that they could do that to to quote unquote prove it. Was it enough? No, because the contrary evidence when they got to be the observes that are, were changed, then essentially the contrary evidence changed it and forced them to modify their theory. So again, theories are constantly modified based on new information, okay? Atomic theory, essentially when you have this with iron rusting, you got oxygen and iron reacting to form iron oxide, atomic theory and a the whole thing of chemistry. Now, chemistry in action, primordial humia, big bang. In 1940, George Gamow hypothesized that the universe began with a gigantic explosion or big bang. The experimental support was expanding universe, cosmic background radiation, and primordial helium. In other words, there was hydrogen first and, and then helium and everything else, and that was a hypothesis. But again, I as a Christian believe that basically there's some evidence of the Big Bang when at the, in the first chapter of Genesis, he says, let there be light, because that's what the scientists say the let there be light means. That essentially there was the energy coming out and then matter came from that by the E equals MC squared thing. So essentially energy, and that's the light, is mass C squared. So essentially when you have the energy equals mass C squared, the energy can be transformed into mass and matter and such like that. So essentially the early elements were then created and then from that but that's a belief I have. Can I prove it? No, okay, but it's a belief. There are different beliefs out there. 
but again, we have to be tolerant of others that people would disagree with us. But that's the way I look at it as a scientist, but also as a believing Christian, okay? So again, the Big Bang Theory is something that is commonly accepted as true because um, there, there are a variety of different the theories regarding the nature of the universe. Where the Big Bang is there was an initial beginning and then everything expanded from that and it could be billions of years old, et cetera, and the universe is constantly expanding. But there's others that believe there was a beginning and then it opened up again and then it closed and then it opened up again and it's, let's say they say it's a cycle, but that cycle essentially going up and out, up and out, that would presume there is no beginning, but can they prove that belief? No, because practically outside of one cycle, it's impossible to even observe what happened with the others. And then they got multiple universes and other things like that, which MCU are coming up with, whether it be the Avengers or or for example, with the Batman multi -universe, multiverse th theory and everything regarding the Flash and other things like that. So people like to think about that kind of thing, but can any of that be proven? No, not really, <laughs> but it's interesting to think about, okay? And people naturally like to think about that kind of thing, okay? Chemistry is the study of matter and the changes it un undergoes. Okay, it's all involving reactions. Okay, so essentially you have the reactions here related to this. Okay, so essentially you start first with matter and then you end up going to uh, other matter by transformations, okay? So essentially you start with a matter and then you go to other matter with those transformations that occur. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. Okay, I, I'm gonna draw on this more, less frequently now to go through the slides because it, it, this is one thing I like about that. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. A substance is a form of matter that has definite composition and distinct properties. And there are two kinds of substances. Oops, go back here like this. Okay, essentially a substance, you have this, you got an elements and compounds. Okay, so you have elements and compounds there. Substance for definite composition, liquid nitrogen, gold ingots, silicon crystals. There's a whole variety of different examples of that. A mixture is a combination of two or more substances in which the substances retain their distinct identities. I happen to have green tea in here. Is that a pure substance? No, it's a mixture. It's got water soluble things in it from, that came from the green tea. So essentially you have that. Sorry, it's too hot. But in any case, the point, the, the point I'm trying to make is that is a mixture, but is a, it's called a solution as well, okay? Um, a homogeneous mixture is a composition of the mixture is the same throughout. Can anybody give me some examples of homogeneous mixtures? What? Very good. Okay, it's usually clear and everything else, okay? What's an example of, uh, of um, a homogeneous mixture that is gaseous? The air, okay? because you can't see the individual molecule, molecules, but essentially you got a homogeneous mixture, which is the air in this room, okay? You can also have a homogeneous mixture that is, uh, that is like an alloy. That would be like the silver alloy in your teeth. Uh, the, it's an amalgam between silver and, um, silver and mercury. And essentially mercury is a solvent, the silver is dissolved in it, and it makes what's called an amalgam, which gets solid. And believe it or not, it's very safe to have in your teeth, in, in your mouth, because the elemental mercury can't get out. So there's a whole variety of different examples of that. Okay, milk, however, I don't know why he puts it in here. 
milk is not a homogeneous mixture. Why? Yes. Yeah, very good. It's like when you make uh, buttermilk or butter, the uh, whey comes out from the, from the buttermilk. Okay, so essentially you have the series of different things related to that. Okay, uh, that would be the next kind of mixture. A composition that is not uniform throughout, that would be a good example of milk. And again, I, I have no idea why this author uh, put, put that in there, but basically it's not uniform throughout because the nature of milk, it's got little globules of fat and protein which make micelles. It's more called an emulsion or a suspension. So basically, if you put it in a centrifuge, you can separate it out, and just like making butter from milk, okay? And that's essentially, it's just continuing to stir it, the fat comes together in the form of butter, okay? So that's a heterogeneous mixture. Another example, iced, iced tea, okay? Iced tea is heterogeneous. The tea is a solution, but the ice in it is separate, it's solid. This happens to be floating in there, okay? Cement, iron, fines, and sand. Physical means can be used to separate a mixture into its pure, pure components, okay? An example of that would be like uh, using a sieve or something like that, or a magnet between sand and, um, sand and uh, this, or distillation re regarding solvents. And there's a couple examples here. If you have a mixture of alcohol and water, distillation is used to separate them out and concentrate the alcohol. For example, in the manufacture of moonshine or in the manufacture of whiskey or whatever else, they have a mash and then essentially they distill, they distill out the, the alcohol or remove the water in such a way by distillation so they increase the alcohol content, okay? But in the case of a mixture of sand and iron, they can use a magnet to separate them out that way, okay? An element is a substance that cannot be separated into simpler, similar substances by chemical means, okay? So essentially, you have an element is, is fundamental. Okay, so essentially you have the element is fundamental there. And essentially that, that is what Dalton was doing before when he came up with the whole concept of atomus. Dalton and atomus. Indivisible. Okay, the indivisible thing I was talking about before. That's very useful. Okay, and from that, basically that was the, uh, the, the key thing regarding how that works. Um, and let me erase what's on the slide. You can see it again, how that works now. Just take it off, see the slide again. Okay, 114 elements have been identified. I think we'll go to the, I think I'll use a highlighter here. And essentially here you got the 114 elements that have been identified there regarding uh, how that works. Okay, and if you look on the periodic table, uh, the ones that go all the way out to 114 on that thing uh, with the other letters, but according, they're already all on this periodic table, they're already up to 119 on there or 118 on that. But they're, they're unknown. They are so short in lifespan, they're just not practical. But I think the other one there, LV116 uh, is the one as of that, a periodic table was done, the one that could be measured as to what its uh, mass was. The other ones are unknown because they are instantaneous. They fall apart too easily. They're all radioactive, okay? Um, 82 elements occurred naturally on Earth, everything up to lead. So essentially, this goes all the way up to lead. up to lead. And so essentially everything up to lead is naturally occurring. The rest above lead, uh, 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 
the rest above that are radioactive and they're, they are c connected to other elements above uh, from 92, um, 92 essentially with uranium and other ones like that. But basically the main ones, most of them up to lead are there, but uh, uranium is also real as is, uh, as is plutonium from the nuclear reactions and there's some other ones that are real too, but they're all radioactive. So that's what the 82 elements including occur naturally on Earth um, in a reasonably abundant form. Okay, and so there's a bunch of different examples regarding each of them. 32 elements have been created by scientists. And uh, those ones in uh, outlined on there, those have been created by scientists. And that includes the technetium the TC down there, number 43, that doesn't occur naturally. So everything on there on that chart that is not thing, it, it does not occur naturally. The other ones essentially are uh, from uranium, the, they're off daughter elements, and then, uh, and then you've got the other ones down below 88 that uh, come from uranium too. But the ones that are naturally occurring and are non-radioactive are stop at lead. Okay, and then the symbols and elements and their symbols. One of the things that's unfortunate about elements and their symbols essentially is a lot of uh, high school t chemistry teachers give, give you this chart and then say, memorize this. But they don't really explain what, what, where the names come from or whatever else. That's why I do it differently and help you to learn how to use the periodic table that you have that, that I gave you a copy of. A compound is a chemical combination of two or more elements. So essentially you got chemical combination of two or more elements. Okay chemically united in fixed proportions as well, okay? And so you can have fixed proportions, but you could also have multiple ones. So again, I, I wrote that on there and now I'm gonna take it off the slide so you can see how that works. Compounds can be separated into pure components, elements by chemical means. So essentially you can break down lithium fluoride here and uh, I'm going to switch now to the laser pointer here regarding this. You have the lithium fluoride here and the quartz and then carbon dioxide. Those can be all broken down to their elements using chemical reactions. It's just a matter of, uh, of how you do it. Okay. Classifications of matter, okay? The first one, matter here, you have mixtures and pure substances. Mixtures can be separated by physical means, okay? Like distill, distillation or even picking the ice out of iced water with, with, ply, with your fingers, okay? That's physical means of separation. You're gonna learn how to separate different things using physical means, I believe, in the laboratory. One of the first labs I've done at other campuses, I haven't looked at the list here, is essentially separating out a mixture of sawdust, sugar, and iron filings. Okay, and if you just think about the sawdust, sugar, and iron filings, how would you separate out the iron filings first? Just think about it. With a magnet, okay? That works for most of them. How would you separate the, the, uh, the sawdust from the sugar? Huh? Oh, it doesn't matter. Well, you just dissolve it in water. Does the sawdust dissolve? No, okay. Then you just filter it. So that's physical means, okay? That's a mixture that can be separated by physical means. Then you have pure mixtures. You have compounds and elements. And then you've got heterogeneous mixtures and homogeneous ones, okay? 
the three states of matter are solid, liquid, and gas. Solid as a definite volume. Okay, a definite volume, et cetera, and shape. Okay, liquid as a definite volume. Okay, does it have a definite shape, a liquid? No, it'll fit the size of the container. Okay, uh, and then a gas, neither. So essentially you have, with a gas, you have neither, uh, neither a definite volume nor a definite shape. And then the three states of matter, a hot poker and a bot of ice, you have liquid, solid, and gas all together there uh, all at once. And that's what you happen if you say, if you do that, or if you put a, um, an ice cube on a burner on your stove, particularly if you have the flat burners like I do on my stove at home with the ceramic top, okay? Just put an ice cube on it, you'll get gas coming off, you'll get the ice and you'll have that coming off too. Types of changes, a physical change does not alter the composition or identity of su substance. What's an example of a physical change? Ice melting. Ice melting. Okay, there's all sorts of other ones you could think of. The next one would be chemical change. Sugar dissolving in water. I'm gonna leave my writing on that there. Chemical change alters the composition or identity of the substance involved. So hydrogen burns in air to form water. You take a piece of paper, you burn it. That is a chemical change. What happens if you add lemon juice to tea and the color changes? Is that a physical change or a chemical change? Yes, because the, essentially you're getting a reaction between the lemon juice and the tea, the, the tea that's been dissolved. And usually it'll turn a little lighter because the tea does act as sort of as an indicator. It's really quite interesting to see that, that it doesn't necessarily turn yellow. It does a little different there with that guy. So there are a whole bunch of different examples of, of chemical changes that you would see in real life that you wouldn't necessarily understand, okay? Extensive and intensive properties. An extensive property depends on the amount of matter being considered. In other words, the mass or the volume, or the volume. And mass is one example, length, volume. An intensive property does not depend on how much matter is being considered there and that would be like the density of substance, the boiling point, the temperature of a substance, the freezing point, the color. So there's two main terms there, extensive property and intensive property. Matter is anything that occupies space and has mass. And I addressed that a little bit. Mass is the measure of a quantity of matter. The unit of mass is the kilogram, okay? And basically that comes from the whole concept of the atomic mass unit and other things that we're addressing in lab this week or next week, okay? But again, you come down with a definite, that's starting off with the mass of a proton, and then you then go to carbon, defining one mole of carbon is 12 grams, and then essentially you have the gram but again, it started off with uh, mass being kilogram because they start off with a measure of weight being the pound, and then the then the French use the kilogram. Yes. Can you go back to the last slide, real quick? Sure. This one. Mm -hmm. uh, and I will I, I will save this PowerPoint and put it up online for you too. So it'll say with notes and it'll be in the Chang in the Chang one too.
I will have the quizzes to return to you next week. Those of you who are going to be virtual, you can come by and pick them up in your office. They'll be available on Monday. I'm going to grade them as soon as we're done today. If you want to find out your quiz grade, just email me. I'll, I'll give it to you. Okay. Essentially, you have mass there. Uh, mat matter that has mass. Measure is a quantity of matter. Essentially, the key thing is the quantity. And then you have a definition, which is a kilogram or a gram. I like the gram as a definition because kilo is what means what? A thousand, yes, okay. So essentially you have that. Weight is the mass times gravity. That is a force. Okay, mass times gravity is a force. So essentially when you have mass times gravity being a force, that is the, when you're standing on the ground, that is the force you're putting on the, on the floor beneath you, okay? But I, me, I have a certain mass here on the earth. I will have the same mass on the moon. The only difference is the gravitational force between both of them. Okay, so essentially you have Earth on the moon, it's like 0 0.1 for, for that. A kilogram, kilogram bar will weigh uh, one kilogram on the Earth, it'll be one kilogram on the moon, uh, moon also. Uh, again, I, this, this is a problem with this. Uh, kilogram is a measure of mass. Uh, weight is a measure of uh, uh, essentially mass times gravity. So essentially gravity is in there as, as the term. So essentially you have mass times gravity. And again, I, I don't know why they make these silly mistakes in the PowerPoint, but they're there. Okay, and the international system of units, we were talking about those already, the meter, the kilogram, the seconds, and that's where you get measurements and, and other things together regarding those. And then these, these things here, and what I want you to learn are all of these, the uh, all the way up to Terra, 10 to the 12th is such, going all the way down the other way. Uh, Pico is not really that important, but uh, Terra to Nano is important. And the reason uh, my list has changed since I started teaching chemistry in 1992, there are terabyte capacity uh, hard drives out there now. Whereas when I was uh, your age, <laughs> that was like a megabyte was the best, okay? So basically there, uh, it, life, life is different for us. And then volume, and, and that's been addressed before on the previous slides, you have that. You have a liter is a cubic, is 1000 cubic centimeters or 1000 milliliters. This is the standard volume there uh, for liquids and solids, a liter, uh, whereas uh, for gases, the cubic meter is more appropriate. And then density, uh, derived value. And then what is its mass, some basic calculations. And, uh, and basically, again, the cancellation of units that I showed you last time before. And what I'm gonna do uh, today is I'm gonna post online for you a, a, a couple worksheets that I'd like you to work on over the weekend and turn in on Monday to me. If you are virtual next week, turn them in during my office hours, but it'll serve as one quiz. It'll be a calculation quiz where I give you a worksheet and ask you to do all the problems on that worksheet and turn it in. And I will just check it off and make sure it's mainly complete. If you have any difficulties with it, I've got a book called Chemical Calculations that I'm gonna go through and we're gonna basically give you a whole series of things to work on just so you can practice the calculations and the things we did on uh, uh, yesterday's lecture. And um, then the things there and then- Dr. Douglas? Yes. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? You were breaking up, I couldn't hear you. Oh, okay, well, um, uh, I'm gonna be passing out, I'm gonna be passing out, uh, emailing everybody uh, uh, a PDF of a worksheet that I'd like you to do over the weekend. Just some practice problems to work on practicing the calculation. 
Okay. Okay. So gotcha. uh, this is you a good summary of quiet. introducing chapter two, as well as uh, as well as going over the fundamentals for chapter one of our book, as well as tying chapters one through three, and uh, and next week we'll continue uh, on Monday there. Any questions? Okay, I'm going to stop the share, people. Now I'm going to stop the screen sharing. Okay, and uh, and we will end we'll end the uh, the video now. I wish all of you well, and I'll see you folks on Monday. I will send out the email regarding which one to attend virtually or in person, and I'll let you know that too. So all the best to all of you. Thank you.